Well, we're trying something different on this evening. We're trying to follow through the whole theme that we've been looking at, leadership at every level, and recognizing that for us, um, how important it is um, for our inward life, our devotional life. Yeah, there are folks waving over there. For my wife. And uh, so what we wanted to do was have an extended interview. He's on the plane back. He's okay. He can go home. Um, we're we're going to have an extended interview with, with Mark. It's, it's such a joy and a privilege to have Mark Dever with us. Many of us will have read materials either authored by Mark or we'll have heard him speak or we'll have been influenced in one way or another. As we were saying at a session earlier today that uh, I was leading that Mark was speaking on, we have been blessed by the way that Mark has used his gifts to raise up leaders. We've had folks speaking at this conference who were in ministry because of involvement with Mark, and we're grateful for that. Mark's been senior pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist Church for 25 years now, uh, which is quite remarkable. Two years later, uh, the whole Nine Marks movement got underway, and that's been uh, a blessing and a help and a stimulus for so many of us. So what I really want to do now is ask Mark something about his own spiritual walk and life so that we can be maybe challenged, maybe encouraged, maybe helped as uh, we're able to engage at that particular level with him. Um, Mark, I think one of the things that we've seen during this last year, it's been a strange year for the evangelical church, particularly, I think, in the States, but it ripples over here. There are lots of men that we have seen and known who have renounced the faith or who have walked away from the faith. And it could well be that there are folks here who feel similar, who are struggling. We're told that the most important thing we can do is to guard our hearts. How do you guard your heart? Well, I think if I just refer to the message we heard last night from Colin, that would be a, a great way to go and, and begin, just think through the basic disciplines, uh, the things that we want to see characterize us, how they can be there, uh, what we want to see happen by God's grace in our own lives. So you, you can't, um, as a pastor, you can't really fake your relationship with the Lord. I mean, you can, but it's, it's not something you want to learn to do. Uh, certainly, I'm a former agnostic, and so I still struggle with doubt at times. But the way I struggle with doubt is always, uh, it's kind of like peripheral vision. There's a natural worldliness in the way that uh, I look at the world. But whenever I stop and look hard at a question, uh, it's clear that the, the Lord's truth uh, is right. And uh, it, unbelief doesn't bear up well under careful examination, I find. Uh, it takes advantage of me just assuming things or not wanting to think about things. So consequently, back to Colin's message, I need to give attention to my own soul. I need to be aware of my struggles. I need to pray specifically. I need to live a transparent life with those that I'm around. So nothing unusual there. But just great confidence in God. I mean, it's yeah, God yeah. is the one who's doing this. So for every well-known American pastor you hear, uh, that betrays, you know, God, turns traitor on him, to use Paul's language in Galatians 1, uh, there are a thousand who follow the Lord faithfully till their last breath. But they're never going to be in the newspapers. HBO is never going to do a special on them. You know, they're, they're, they're not going to get any ratings. So don't get too fearful and discouraged. Our, our hope is built on Christ. L let me try and push you a bit further. So in, in terms of your own practice, how, how do you attend to your heart? How, how do you have routines that you work through? Do you have things, obviously, apart from the word that you say, I'm going to read, I'm going to encourage my heart, I'm going to stimulate my heart, I'm going to move myself to repent? You know, what, what is your practice? Uh, classic practices of first thing when I get up in the morning, read the Bible and pray. So I'm always at least reading the portion of scripture that I'm going to hear preach this coming Lord's Day morning, whether I'm preaching or somebody else. 
Now, maybe reading other things also, but I'll at least read that. I'll try to meditate on that. I'll pray from that scripture for myself, my family, my day, two pages of our church membership directory. Uh, I'll pray through my schedule uh, for the day. And all that could be done, you know, in anywhere from five minutes to two hours. It just depends on when I woke up and what's about to happen. Um, <laughs> And then I find, uh, I find certain kinds of things very edifying to read. Uh, Spurgeon just never fails. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Every paragraph the brother wrote, he's just unable to write an unedifying paragraph. <laughs> uh, so Spurgeon. Um, Valley of Vision, I love reading. It's, it's good for my soul, praying through those prayers. Uh, yeah, tons of, of good resources. I, I'm interested that you, it, it doesn't seem that you have a set pattern, therefore, when you talk about between five minutes and two hours, depending on what time you wake up. You, I normally you, wake up, up at six, and uh, so it's pretty normal. I'm just trying to give, you know, yeah, yeah, accurate yeah, yeah, yeah. variance. And, and when, you say, uh, uh, when you say that you read the scriptures and you're saying, are you following a particular pattern? Or yeah. you said you're, according to your preaching, is there a danger? Not my preaching. It's whatever I'm hearing preached. Okay. So I knew I was going to be at Grace Church in Guilford this coming Sunday. So I found out that David was preaching on Jonah 3. So all week I've been reading Jonah 3. So I just worked to calibrate my heart to whatever I'm going to hear preached on the Lord's Day. You, you're an extrovert, self-confessed extrovert. Does that impact you as you guard your heart, as you look to the Lord? Does that make any difference to you? Uh, well, it probably means some things are not trials to my flesh that are trials to other people's flesh, but there's good and bad in that. So it, it takes me no energy to have this conversation. Mm. You know, this is... For you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but even that's good and bad. Yeah. Uh, the good means it's, it's cost me little to agree to do something like this. Uh, the bad is, well, I might not be as reflective about it. I might not value it as I should. I might not be as prayerful about it. Praying. Do you find prayer easy? I think so. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I think we're willing to forgive you for that one. Um, I mean, it's, I, uh, I find it very natural. So, do you pray out loud? Do you, do you speak out or do you internalize? Uh, if no one else is around, I may pray out loud. Uh, if other people are around, no, I'll tend to be quiet and just you know, listen to what you're saying and agree with you. I'm all for that. Um, now, you said you, you prayed through your, your church directory. Do you yeah. use other aids, reading lists, prayer lists? Uh, I have at various times in my Christian life. So I've kept prayer cards. I've had other kind of prayer lists. So it varies from season to season. Okay. You mentioned you're married to Connie. Correct. How, how do you You're make... starring in a new video for her. Yes, thank you. That she'll be getting in about an hour. And I realize I should never have pulled that face. Uh, uh, Honey, this is the cheerful person who just yeah. talked to me in front of everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're normal in the UK, honey. Honestly, they are. Um, do, you, do you set aside time to, to pray together as a couple? Do you deliberately try and structure that? Uh, again, no, but it's frequent. So the beginning of the day and before dinner, we'll always be praying. And it's just us at home now. There are no kids, so we can pray more extendedly at those times. And it's, it's fine, as long as the food's not getting too cold. Okay. <laughs> Have you noticed that there are seasons in the soul? From what you're saying, it sounds a fairly standard pattern. Has that always been your experience, or were there particular times and events that caused you greater difficulty? Uh, certainly. I, I, in my own soul, I had one year in, during my undergraduate career, which I was a Christian, which I really struggled with depression. Uh, and that's, that's the only year like that. That was a super fruitful year spiritually. Uh, it was terrible to live through for me. I'd like to never do that again. Uh, but it was really useful. Uh, since then, I would say most of the variety comes just from outward circumstances. Uh, something goes wrong with one of our kids, or, or I'm facing a, a huge thing coming up at church. Uh, yeah, it could be things like that. Mark, you're particularly known for raising up leaders. It's what you were talking to us earlier about so helpfully at a, a, a seminar. You have a, 
it seems a remarkable gift of connecting with people, getting to know people, loving people, taking interest in people, following um, that through. You have two of the guys here. You, you regularly bring some interns with you so that they're exposed to uh, a wider model of church life. Do you spend time as you train up interns in talking about their walk with the Lord? In, in, does that feature largely, or would you be really pushing the doctrine home? How, how much do you press them on the internal life? Uh, probably quite a bit. I don't know if I'd use the verb press, but I'm, uh, I'm probably not talking to them a lot about doctrine. I don't know. Do I talk to you much about doctrine? Ecclesiology. Ecclesiology. Thank you, Caleb. Uh, <laughs> Jacob, what? You... No, it, it's, it's, it's more just kind of how life is going. How's your wife? How's your relationship with your wife? Here's what's going on with me and Connie. Uh, things I know they're thinking about, just trying to help them think well about things, asking questions, not too often giving advice, more just Socratically trying to help them think about key issues. So would, for example, what we've been trying to do over this conference, talking about uh, as we are as, as leaders, and there's been a lot of focus on who we are as leaders, Colin t telling us to identify our sins and, and deal with that, would that be uh, fairly common in the American experience, or is this, would you put it down to a more pietistic European model that we're following? How do you relate to what we're trying to do? Uh, I relate to what you're trying to do is thinking what you're trying to do is biblical. Um, so I, I don't associate with Europe at all. Uh, uh, <laughs> we're not going there, guys. Uh, we're not I, going there. I, I have found uh, a lot of uh, British evangelicals, maybe it was just the people I hung out with, pretty hostile to pietism. Uh, well, pietism is not a great word because it has a particular history in Germany and... Yeah. Uh, toward uh, obvious acts of piety. So if I read C.H. Spurgeon and J.C. Ryle, I'm gonna feel, if somebody's telling me they're doing that, they're not British, they're probably American. So I associate reformed historic piety not with British Christians, but with American Christians. Banner says they sell far more books in America than in Britain. So I am super excited about Banner Truth books. And I don't know that I had any friends in Britain who were. Uh, when I lived here for six and a half years. At, at our church in Cambridge, it was the old people that I got on with well. You know, the, the people in their 70s and 80s. We would read and get excited by the same stuff. Uh, I would have to more sort of train the younger ones to be excited by it. Whereas in America, there just seems to be, you know, I can hold up a book by J.C. Ryle and it just is snatched right up by some 25-year-old in, in a way that I'm not so used to here, though that may be typical of your churches. Do you want to hold up any books that might get snatched away? Uh, I'll give you two books right now. Uh, to, a, to a pastor, if you're the main preaching pastor, and you would like to help your church get better at prayer, John Onwachekwa has written a superb book on prayer. It's one of the best in this Building Healthy Churches series. Real pleased with it, about helping your church think through prayer. If you would like to read this soon, okay, right here, second row. Um, I'm going to pitch it, and you can give it to him. Thank you. And then, um, <clears throat> Orlando, you can take it, man. Your hand was up. Um, and then another person who was a member of our church and is now in Dubai for the last 15 years, uh, Carrie Fulmer's book, The Good Portion, Scripture, The Doctrine of Scripture for Every Woman. There are a lot of good books for the sisters in our church out there, and as pastors, we should be plugging those along. So if there's a sister here who would like to read a good book on the doctrine of Scripture, uh, this is written by Carrie Fulmer, great stuff. Caleb, can you give this to, right, right back behind you? Just keep your hand up. There it comes. Yes, Andy, thank you. That was a pretty good segue, didn't you? Thanks, think? man. Yeah, it was great. We need, knew we needed to do that. Um, am I right in thinking that Sibs was your, you, you, you did, was it your doctorate on Sibs? You, you did particular studies on Richard Sibs? Or have I misread my research? That's correct. <laughs> Just you. waiting for you to finish. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I asked because sweet Sibs and, and, and everything, I, Addressing the soul. Uh, is, it true, oh, so or, good. is it true that you also think Sibs was incomplete? That you um, thought there are things he should have said or he didn't say quite as he ought to have done? Of course. He's an Anglican. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
No, I, I'm dead serious. And I'm sure there are Anglicans here. God bless you, brothers and sisters. But, but listen, he, he thinks that Scripture is not as clear on the church as I think it is. So when you get to the individual heart and soul, I'm right with him and he's my teacher. But when you get anywhere near the church, I'm thinking he's a little compromised and he hasn't read his Bible carefully enough. <laughs> but I love him dearly. I am his student. Okay, I'll set him up. You just hit them out of the park, brother. Uh, um, could I, in your particular... Well, and mind you, I'm giving back to him because in his time, Sibs was known, and I quote, as being the best in London at bringing them about who were tempted into nonconformity. Because he had, look at who his disciples were, Thomas Goodwin, John Cotton. I mean, th these people kept going and, and becoming congregationalists. So I think he felt a little threatened, so he put a lot of energy into keeping people in the Church of England. So, you know, I, f I feel for him. I'm, I'm sure he's very grateful for that. <laughs> um, one, in your position, um, you, you are noted within American evangelicalism, or at least certainly to us, and you're certainly noted on social media. You, you come in for a lot of criticism. I, I, every Christian leader in America that I've come across comes in for lots of criticism. Some is justified. I'm not so sure that the stuff I've read about you is justified. I do I really hate old people? No. Yeah. Do was, I really hate America? It was no. a great article. Why Mark Dever hates America and hates old people. I was expecting a sort of subline and kicks puppies. That, that's there too. You can find it. Yeah. <laughs> How do you cope with that? Because if some of us, maybe the more introverted, if someone says something unkind about us, it destroys us, or at the end of a sermon. We forget all the nice things people have said, and the one critical comment that was given to us. We just dwell on that and turn it over, and it can ruin us. How do you cope with that level of vitriol that is directed to you? Sibs, if I can quote Sibs, said... Uh... If you live in the mouths of men, you will die in the mouths of men. Uh, you just, it, it, they're, they're going to have absolutely no say on my soul, ultimately. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in debt to them. I, I owe no man anything but love. Uh, it's just, it's of, it's of no consequence. Others wouldn't find it as easy. There you have it. Maybe I'm a bit of a sociopath. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> John Stevens, yeah, you were right. <laughs> You're the one who thought this interview could be helpful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move quickly on. Um, I, I'd like to talk about some of the the way that you do training and interact with some of our guys. I was saying um, earlier at the earlier session that we had, um, now I'm um, part of the pastoral team at, at Charlotte Chapel as well as still working for FIC, um, that the, uh, our guys, Liam Garvey, Paul Reese, known to you, you were instrumental actually in bringing them together as a team at Charlotte, for which we are immensely grateful. Uh, your love and care for so many men is really qu quite remarkable. And when I was talking to Paul about it, he said it was the long weekender that you do from time to time. Could you explain what, what you do at that? And you, you gather a, a large number of guys to that? Yeah, back in 1997, I guess, we had some seminary students at Southern Seminary in Louisville who said, hey, could we come out and just spend a long weekend at your church, just looking at things and uh, going to a member's We'd had a members meeting scheduled for that weekend, going to a members meeting. Uh, and we don't normally have non-members in the members meetings. And uh, I said, sure. So they came out. Uh, I ended up giving a couple of lectures during the weekend. Uh, they observed things. And uh, they were encouraged by it. And so another group asked if they could do it you know, a few months after that. And so we started having these weekenders where we have pastors and seminarians and, and other you know, elders or, or proto-elders come for a, a Thursday night through a Monday morning. 
And we do this the third weekend in March, May, and September. And we've been doing it ever since then. And the Lord seems to use it not because they're viewing a church that has it all together. In fact, in that first, in that first elder, uh, weekender, we didn't have elders yet. And the members meeting was like a food fight over whether or not we're going to stay on the radio, paying money to have the sermons broadcast on the radio. Uh, but my thought was you should come and look not because we're doing everything perfectly, but because, hey, we're going to be very transparent. And then you, coming from your church, can reflect on this, use this as an opportunity, an excuse to reflect on what you're doing as a church, and Lord willing, you can get better at something as you give self-conscious attention to what you see us doing. Maybe you'll learn some good things from us, and maybe you'll see some things like, oh, we're not going to do that. You know, but either way, it can be useful. Were they subject-based? Was it a particular theme that you'd pick up on each one, or was it a general... It's the same thing every time. And you just see where it goes and you go with it. Well, so the, you, you come, the first thing it starts out with is an elders meeting. You sit through a real elders meeting. And that elders meeting is not set up because there's a weekender. It's just whatever our elders meeting is. It's just whatever business is coming before us. How many come along to that? Well, these days we have about 150 at a time. Um, so, sorry, you have 150 sitting in on your elders meeting? Yeah. We do. We got good elders, man. Yeah. We have the elders all mic'd so everybody can hear them. Uh, we exhort them very carefully. This is a real elders meeting, so you need to not be talking about what you hear in this meeting outside of this meeting. We're not putting on a play here. These are real people's souls. Uh, so just listen, pray for us, and uh, hopefully you, and if you've come two or three from the same church, you can talk about it with you and your fellow elders when you get back. How many men do you think have sort of made use of the long weekenders? How many have... If I said, I've no gone idea. through your hands, but no idea. It's, it's, from what I'm picking up, there's, it's had massive influence, and we just say thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Andy, I would encourage Charlotte Chapel and other churches here in the UK, I would encourage you guys to do the same thing. You know, and maybe you're doing it, I don't know, but I've strongly encouraged churches, please have weekenders like this, where you just open up your practices to other churches, and you say, well, nobody would want to come. Well, listen, nobody wanted to come to us first at all. There were like 10 people. But slowly but surely, it became known as something helpful. Um, so if your church, particularly if you're a larger church in an area, uh, you might be able to be a real blessing to your sister congregations uh, by letting them come, maybe bring a, a young minister with them, uh, watch what you're doing, learn from it, and be able to incorporate some new practices or think through some issues together using you guys as a kind of whiteboard. Yeah, and, and strange you should say that because when I was talking to Paul about you and about the long weekend, as he then said, and, and Liam then said, we should do something like Amen. that. Amen. So hopefully. Well, and brother, they're being done in Johannesburg, in a couple places in the U.S., in Portland and Austin. They're being done in Toronto, Canada. So uh, I know a number of places around the world, I think in Santo Domingo and the Dominican Republic, where they are being done, uh, maybe in Dubai. So. Mm. There's a whole number of guys here, young guys, who are entering ministry, looking upon ministry. What would you say to these guys? What, what are the important things that, that they should be thinking about, that they should be dwelling on? I think a more thoughtful and organized answer has been given to you to that by Colin's message to us, and his two messages, really. So I, I second my time to Colin. I'll say some less important things, uh, some more pedestrian things. Uh, if you're married, your wife better think you're a good preacher. Um, I find wives extraordinarily accurate generally in assessing the guy's preaching. So when I have a young couple in my church that join and I'm in a conversation and it gets clear that he thinks he's called into preaching, I inevitably just turn to the wife and I'll just say, is he a good preacher? And uh, interesting and telling responses. <laughs> um, Contemplating being a pastor is contemplating one of the highest privileges you could conceive of. Uh, you know, Christ died for these sheep. Uh, he did not take it lightly. They're not our sheep. They're his. And for him to entrust their care to us is amazing. So there are plenty of trials of being a pastor, and we all hear about those. But the privilege is staggering. And I would encourage you to find things that communicate that to your own soul and read and think on those things. Uh, somebody, I think it was Colin earlier, quoted Charles Bridges' book, The Christian Ministry. I think Bridges was even down here in this part of the country. 
But uh, I would encourage you to read that book, The Christian Ministry by Charles Bridges. Uh, while you're talking about books that you should read, do, do you want to maybe suggest other titles that, again, guys young into ministry, what would you say are some of the basic texts? Yeah, it depends a little bit on the guy. Some guys are really good pastors, but they're just not very reedy. You know, that's okay. So it just, it just depends. Charles Bridges, I've just mentioned, he was writing in 1829, almost 200 years ago. Some guys are just not going to read that stuff very easily. So it kind of depends on who I'm talking to. So those are a little bit more tailored. Uh, but, I, but I can tell you, generally, man, anything by Spurgeon and Ryle is going to be gold. So just grab Spurgeon and Ryle. Sibs will be good for your own soul individually. Steer clear of the ecclesiology. There's not much of it in there, though. Um... J.I. Packers, Knowing God, J.I. Packers, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Preaching and Preachers, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Spiritual Depression. Um, yeah, all very predictable. Oh, Spurgeon's Lectures to My Students. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just so good. It's uh, four volumes, and usually published in one volume together. Uh, there are Friday afternoon talks where he would come by. Some of you have told me, you listen to Pastor Talk, this uh, interview that Jonathan Lehman and I do a podcast I almost never know what they're going to be on ahead of time. Jonathan literally just sits down in my office and starts talking to me about something. Now, he's planned it. He knows, but I, I don't know. Spurgeon's a little bit like that with lectures to my student. It's kind of like a 19th century podcast because it's just Friday afternoon, and he stops by, and he just kind of unloads on the students of the pastor's college uh, what he's thinking about. And the man was both insightful and hilarious. Mm -hmm. So he'll, he'll keep you going on a Friday afternoon. Lectures to my students. Yeah, postures in preaching can't be matched, can it? We now know how to preach and point to Jesus. Boy uh, Jones, Preaching and Preachers, super opinionated. I do not agree with everything in there, but man, a lot of it's so good. Yeah. Um, you made reference to the difference between America and the British church scene, how we do ourselves down. Yeah. Um, do you want to reflect on that again? Because there'll be others here who wouldn't, uh, didn't hear what you were saying earlier. Yeah, I just observed at the beginning of the seminar I did uh, this morning that uh, it's interesting being asked to come over here because very often the vibe I pick up from my English friends is, oh, we're all messed up. You guys over there, you do everything so well. And of course, you don't really think that. That's not what you're going to say to each other. But there, but there is a part of you that does seem to think that. And uh, as somebody who was just at the Southern Baptist Convention this last summer, I'm just thinking if the first three messages we heard from John and Colin were the first three messages at the Southern Baptist Convention this last summer, I would just be blown away and think the Lord had returned. I mean, this is, I would become a post-millennialist. I mean, this is really. So there, there are many things about preaching the word and loving Christ's sheep that I think on the, on the average, you guys do on the average better than is commonly done in American evangelical circles. And uh, maybe you're scared to think that lest you just think that's some leftover British pride. But I would just tell you, as somebody who, I love America, I love Americans. There were, there were things I was glad to leave about England when I left here and went back to America. So I've got, I don't think I have, a, you know, just a, a kind of prejudice toward the British. But I would just say there are pros and cons everywhere. And there are a lot more pros here than you may sometimes realize. So I think what the Lord is doing here is very good. Nine marks. They, they, yeah. they produce some stuff which some of our guys read. So. Well, some of you guys have written some of it, but yes, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> and all the better for it. Yeah. So, just a little bit on, on Nine Marks. Go to ninemarks.org. You can see material. We try to have free stuff there for pastors and church leaders. We had a decision early on. When it started, it was Matt Schmucker just saying, Hey, can I just put a microphone up to your mouth while you're pastoring Capitol Hill? Just take the good stuff for other pastors. I said, Sure. But after a couple of years, it was clear that there were so many guys out there who agreed with those basic nine marks we talked about of a healthy church. And we had the decision, do we make this like Ligonier, the teaching ministry of R.C. Sproul, or Desiring God, teaching ministry of John Piper, or Grace to You, teaching ministry of John MacArthur, or do we make it not like that? And we spent a whole day away talking and praying, and we all unanimously thought, we make it not like that. So we want Mark's voice to become small in it. We want these ideas to be prominent. We think they're all in Scripture, and we just want to find other voices literally from all the continents that are agreeing with these, these ideas and, and help to build a platform that lifts their voices, kind of a, a pastor's cooperative. And that's what Nine Marks uh, very much has become. And I'm 
delighted to be a part of it and hope it's a, a good gift and helpful to your congregations. It is. Thank you. We're coming to the end of this interview, but before we do, Mark, how can we pray for you? Uh, pray for me the same kind of things you're praying for yourself. Pray that I love my wife well, uh, that I have wisdom in knowing how to love well Connie and our two kids, two adult children. Um, pray for my wisdom in pastoring our church. The Lord gives us great opportunities and we have great challenges. Uh, our part of DC that we minister to uh, has a lot of transients, so we will cycle through oh, lots of people every year. We have 950 members. And uh, so at every members meeting, which happens every other month, we will, you know, see out 30 or 40 members and see in 30 or 40 members. And so that's just a lot of souls to be dealing with all the time uh, in those kinds of ways. And it takes a lot of time and it's a great stewardship, but just pray the Lord gives us wisdom. Okay, great. Thank you. I I'm going to pray for Mark right now. Father, we thank you that you have given Mark as a gift to the church. We thank you for the way that... He blesses us. Thank you for the many gifts uh, that he has. Father, we, we want to pray for him in his responsibilities uh, there at Capitol Hill. Father, we pray for that church. Thank you for its location. Thank you for its elders and for the members. Father, we, we pray for those it trains up, those who move through that church and onto other areas that, Father, they may take the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and live it out and apply it well and speak it out to the new areas that they go to. Father, we, we pray for that church as it uh, lives out the gospel, as it meets the needs of its community. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters and thank you for them. Pray that you would strengthen them. We pray for those who have particular responsibilities in government and administration. Sovereign God, that they would seek you above all things. Father, we pray for Mark. We pray that, Father, you would sustain him. We pray that he would be able to finish the race. Father, as we get older, we realize what a wonderful claim it was of Paul's to say that he's finished the race. Father, enable Mark to finish the race well. Father, want to pray for Connie. We thank you for her. And Father, we ask that you would bless her richly. We realize the sacrifices she makes with Mark away. We thank you for the way that you sustained her during illness. Lord God, we want to pray for Mark's two children, grown-up children. Sovereign God, would you have mercy upon them? We thank you for them. And we do pray uh, that each of them would know the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives every day. Father, bless them. Bless Mark and Connie in their responsibilities as parents. And Father, we think of the uh, Nine Marks movement. We thank you for all that is produced. We thank you for the guys who've been raised up. We thank you for the publications that come out. And thank you for the way that they so practically take issues and apply them to our church lives. Thank you that we have these tools and resources to bless us. So, Father, we pray for ourselves. We pray that you would challenge us to be the men and the women that we ought to be. We pray that we might have a closer walk with God. We pray for our prayer lives. Lord, not every one of us is able to say that we find prayer easy. Father, for some of us, we find it the hardest thing to do. But we want to pray better. We want to know you better. Lord, we want your word to take us and shape us and change us. We want to be those whose lives are evidently holy and authentic for the glory of King Jesus. So, Father, thank you for Mark. Father, help us to take from what he has said that which will build us up in our walk. And we ask it all in Jesus' name.